The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies and also by the generous donations of you, the listener. A huge thanks goes to Marcus Wheeler, Tobias Whiting, Alex McIntosh, Peter Millen, David Jakowsin, Keith Erickson and Glenn Oberhauser. Thank you all for your very generous support. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast, episode 184. Pickett's Charge. With hosts Neil Shook, Mike Hobbs, Mike Whitaker, and Dave Luff, and guest Dave Brown. to an episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. I'm your host, Neil Shook. Now, here's the thing. I must admit, I have always been a little bit paranoid about show length, which, considering the sort of stuff we've been producing over the last 12 months, may make some of you, <laughs> yeah, trying to go, really? <laughs> now, I know earlier this year we put together a complete new show format with new sections for what we've been up to and for hobby news and the mailbag and what have you as well as our usual interviews and reviews and that's gone down very positively we've had a lot of positive feedback from that from yourselves but the problem is this obviously with chatting about hobby news and chatting about what we've been up to we get into discussions uh, about various different bits and pieces, and also obviously as also as we do mailbags, and also obviously when we interview people, we like to chat. It's not one of those things where we turn around to our guests and say, "Right, you've got an hour." We tend to carry on the conversation until it na- comes to its natural completion, which sometimes can take three quarters of an hour, sometimes can take an hour, and sometimes can take some time more than that. So we're not really known for kind of keeping to a rigid show schedule. Um, And anyone who listens to the show on a regular basis will realise that. Now that has its positives in the fact of it, you know, it gives us space to actually, uh, you know, converse as opposed to constantly watching the clock. The downside is shows can be quite long. And especially this year, the shows are getting up three and a half, four hours. Which, if I'm perfectly honest, to me, is too long. Okay, I know several people turn around and say, yeah, great, you know, the longer the show, the better. Brilliant. For me, that's too long. Whilst I've been producing the shows, in, in my heart of hearts, I've been, I've been worried about how long they're getting, okay? Now, at the same time, I don't want to change what we're doing, because actually I think what we're doing is actually pretty good. You know, I think we get, I think we provide good conversations with our guests, uh, which are you know, interesting. And also, between the hosts we have on the show, uh, we have uh, a good repartee, uh, a good range of views, and I think we get a good discussion out of it, which the feedback is people find interesting. So, whilst all the bits are good, when you put them all together, what's the phrase, you can't, fit a qu- you can't fit a quart in a pint pot? And so, rather than producing the quart, what I want to try and do, actually, is to kind of cut things down a bit. Now, this has kind of come to a head in this latest set of shows. I mean, as you know, we, we produced Show 183, which is uh, a show about mythic battles. That was originally meant to be Uh, a short interview in the new segment of this show. Okay, and as you saw, 
he kind of you know went on a bit longer than what we anticipated. When I then came to edit what was going to be the next show, there was just simply too much stuff. It was just simply too much of it to fit into a single show. But at the end of the day, what we'd recorded, I thought, was actually quite good and useful. So I didn't want to end up with the fact that half of it lay on the cutting room floor. The only other way of doing it, without you listening to a five-hour show, which, despite the fact that I know some people you know, wouldn't complain about it, for some you know, other people, that's a, that's a real deal-breaker. I'm not going to go there. So I thought, tell you what, what we'll do, we'll release shorter shows, and we'll release them more frequently. So, uh, uh, to be honest, at the moment, we've got material for three shows in what I'm editing at the moment for what would have been show 184. So that's what I've done. Okay, the result is this episode, 184, is the first of a couple of interviews we've got coming up for you in the, in the near future. This is an interview with Dave Brown, all about his new set of rules, Pickett's Charge, which have recently been released under the Rice of its Press label. We'll take a quick break, and when you come back, you'll listen to an interview. The interviewers are myself, Mike Hobbs, Mike Whitaker, and Dave Luff, and we're chatting to Dave Brown all about Pickett's Charge. I must get through to Sergeant Watson's position. Jenkins, cover me! Sergeant Watson, bring your men in! Withdraw! It's all right, sir. We're enjoying ourselves. What? Yes, sir. It's these here chain of command rules, sir. We're having great fun. Chain of command? That's right, sir. It's that challenging but fun blend of command and control. It gives me the freedom I want to fight the way I want to. Never had so much fun, sir. But we've cooked you some sausages. Can't be helped, sir. Me and the lads are staying put. Chain of command, World War II, platoon level rules from two fat lardies. They really put you in control. And they're even better than sausages. Have you ever wondered what's going on in Wargaming? We do too. So come with us as we go behind the hobby with the Meeples and Miniatures interview. very pleased to welcome to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast, uh, Mr. Dave Brown. Hello, sir. Hello. Happy to be here. Yeah, welcome to the show. So Dave is the author of uh, a new set of rules, the first set of rules to uh, be published by Royce Fitz Press, and this is uh, Pickett's Charge, which, I don't know, um, probably from the title will probably give it away to say it's 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 an ACW set of rules. Indeed, it is. <laughs> <laughs> really funny going, no, it's steampunk mass battle. Got you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Right, okay. So, um, obviously, it's Dave's first time on the show. So, uh, as is our tradition, the first thing we'd we like, we like to do, Dave, is find out a little bit about you and uh, and how you got into wargaming and the hobby in general. So, can you just give us a bit of your background? Yeah, I think it probably started, uh, like many people did, with... Uh Airfix. Hey, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so, okay, for all those playing bingo, that's Airfix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably sorry enough, I think my uh, my father came along one day, didn't he, with a, a box of, I'm pretty sure it was US Infantry or US Marines, one thirty second scale uh, oh. plastic Airfix. That was uh, uh, my first one, and uh, unbeknown to me, the lads, there were, there's a farm just uh, down the road that had three lads that were there, 
and they actually played what they introduced me to proper wargaming. Oh, so, wow. uh, I, yeah, I took along my uh, my epic soldiers, and they uh, instead of throwing marbles at them and, and that sort of thing is what we used to do, they actually uh, showed me that a uh, standing man could say move six inches, whereas you're, you're lying down, whatever rifleman or machine gunner could move three, and firing was uh, unbelievably was rolling a d6 a six sided dice and if you got a four five or six the man was man was hit if he was in the open and it was even as sophisticated to go if he was in cover you needed a five or six and one twos and threes uh, were misses from i was probably about i don't know probably 10 or 11 when they first introduced me to to that style of wargaming and i didn't really look back from there I moved on, uh, probably like everyone else did. Collected all the 170, what was I think? What were they? 172nd, 176 Airfix, all the yellow Napoleonic ones. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, one, yeah, yeah 170, 176, wasn't it? Which, which wouldn't take paint in a month of sun. Nah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, absolutely tried to. Uh, this is where going back to the infamous banana oil, isn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, no, I, I've never ever managed to buy any banana oil. And living in a, uh, a little village near Taunton in Somerset, you had no hope of getting that stuff. I was always uh, told. I was told the trick was I actually dunk it in PBA. Oh, there you go. No, I didn't do that. I just I think I cleaned them. I think I read somewhere in one of the early magazines if you give them a quick clean and then and then painted them. But I still find you know, after a few months, uh, great chips of paint came off their arms or. Or their shakos or whatever. Yeah, great chips of paint that sort of look like the the the, the outer shell of a figure. In fact, <laughs> yes, that they right. come out shaped. But, oh, I remember that. Through it, yeah. So uh, a lot of so them, discouraging. Uh, <laughs> yes, it was. So a lot of them ended up with a very heavy coat of varnish. I think I even used my dad's wood varnish at some stage to make sure all that paint stayed on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they I, they were uh, used along with I think the. Pretty well known uh, Bruce Quarry's airfix rules. Oh, right, yeah. Ooh, yeah. He used um, they, they were quite controversial at the time, weren't they? Well, yeah, I mean, they were. How shall I say? They, they were interesting uh, and develop your math skills, especially divided oh, by they? five. So uh, they provided a lot of entertainment with a few close associates at school. Uh, before moving on to uh, to venture into other periods, I think we picked up um, Operation Warboard. Um, oh, Operation Warboard, what a fantastic set of rules they were. Yes. Yeah, that's how I got into it. Yeah. It was, yeah, they they were, and I think they still are actually a very good set of rules. We're always quite taken with, I think, the uh, machine gun grid that you had to make out of some kind of laminate. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was, yeah. What, yeah, I always remember having that going, Dad. <laughs> and you get, <laughs> I need yeah, a piece of, yeah, laminate or a piece of perspex like this. Yep, what the heck did you do that for? Quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we 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 couldn't uh, couldn't get hold of any for that, and the only the only place we had them was at our school, where the teachers would use would write kind of notes on this overhead projector on laminate. So uh, we had to do a little bit of a, a raid into the uh, into the school <laughs> once to acquire, shall I say, some of this laminate for our uh, machine gun grids. <laughs> so uh, and then moving on. Got my again. My father took me down to uh, Taunton uh, one night and introduced me to the uh, Taunton War Games Club, uh, where they were uh, busy engaged in WRG Fifth Edition Ancients, uh, fifteen mil. Got got involved in that before uh, moving on to run down the other you know, numerous kind of other rules, such as uh, in the Grand Manor, Napoleon's battles, a bit of squad leader, and dare I say it, even a bit of D and D. That sneaked in at the end. Oh, you, you, no, I was with D and D. No, I was. I'm going to say. I think. I think most yep. of us have been there in that time. <laughs> Get me in gaming for a decade or two. That's right. Yeah, again, I think when I was at uh, the good old Bristol Poly, we uh, we invented our own uh, war game society, of which D and D had a very prominent part, uh, along with other board games, uh, etc. So we carried that on. Carried that on forward. Took a bit of a hiatus, I think, like many people do, isn't it? When you when you leave college, get your first job, etc., and then uh, decided that carried on, moved down to to London, picked up with a, a new club down in Loughton, 
which had a good couple of characters, and that's uh, where I initially uh, kicked off with a very, very initial development of General to Brigade Napoleonic Rules, which I was quite fortunate enough for, for them to, to be published, and some people, uh, I believe, even play them. So that was all <laughs> <laughs> You're far too modest, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, uh, yeah, that, and I think the rest, you know, isn't it? A little bit of a dabble into uh, World War Two with Battle Group Panzer Grenadier and uh, and also the ACW variant of, with Guns of Gettysburg, which kind of um, pretty much takes us up to date. Mm-hmm. So, considering you've already written one set of ACW rules, mm-hmm. and here we are looking at Pickett's Charge, which is another set. Uh, why revisit ACW? Is that a period? that um, holds a particular... Is that one of your particular go-to periods? Yeah, I mean, I think my uh, my top two are Na- Napoleonic and the AC- ACW. They're, they're, they're both periods that only are they are particularly uh, interesting, but they're, they're, they're kind of your classic, almost kind of mass battles of the, uh, of the time, isn't it? You've got all the different formations you've got line you've got column and um, the acw isn't it you've got variants of, of skirmish order in all the different types of artillery all the different types types of weapons and in a way isn't it quite plays into almost into the kind of the uh, slightly geeky side of me that quite likes all that kind of detailed stuff hmm. so yeah so combined with the, the history the kind of grandeur of it and all the the, the weapon details it still has a uh, there's a great appeal, and especially when you're reading of accounts like kind of, you know, both battles at Antietam, you know, the uh, assault attacks into the cornfield or at Gettysburg, and, you know, attacks over the, the, the peach, orchard, peach orchard to make some very good reading. And, and I think it's just a desire to kind of recreate those battles or parts of those battles uh, on the tabletop. So what sort of scale would you say biggest charge is? Game scale, it's um, divisional, uh, up up to core. Um, again, you can use, I use my standard 15 millimeter armies, but it can cater for 28. So you, if you're up, up at your, your, uh, your club on a club night, you could have uh, three, four, five brigades uh, aside. If you've got longer, as uh, some people are quite lucky, might even get a, uh, a day's game. You could even go up to um, a core. When we're doing the, uh, the play testing of it, we, we went up to the um, War Games Holiday Centre and spent a whole weekend uh, refighting Stones River with Mark Freif, uh, using 28s over his vast tables, <laughs> uh, which was uh, which was pretty good. So uh, you had the whole Friday, Saturday, and Sunday there. So it, it it's it's flexible depending on on what people want. <laughs> so would you say that a Average unit would represent a battalion or a regiment. Or, although the uh, the game concentrates quite heavily on brigades, your it the, it still represents has its tactical units that are in there. Mm. So for for your ACW, it will be your infantry regiment, your cavalry squadron or regiment, uh, and your artillery battery. Because I think those by having those tactical units on the table, it gives quite a uh, a good feel and and uh, association with the period. Yeah, cool. So, for a sort of average club night, you see you're still looking at about a, a division size game. Yeah. Gates. Yeah, definitely. You def- I mean, it depends on what uh, you, could cu- you could come up, you could have three or four brigades. I mean, uh, there's a, uh, a very nice little introductory scenario in the rules, which basically has, I think, um, three Confederate brigades just holding the sunken lane at uh, Antietam uh, and being attacked by uh, four brigades. It's very simple, very uh, straightforward, and uh, can can be finished in, in in the club night. That's what kind of the the average game you, you're kind of looking at. I think that players would have um, anything up to five brigades. Yeah, cool. So as far as when it comes down to representing units and um, how many miniatures you may need for for an average game, how are the units represented and, yeah, basically how big an army do you need? One of the uh, things I wanted to do with uh, Pickett's Charge and 
the kind of sister rules that are developing for the Napoleonic one is to kind of get away from from kind of fixed basing and fixed uh, figure requirements because clearly some some people have different armies and, and enjoy painting up loads of figures and other people don't. Hmm. So we thought, right, okay, what we'll do, I'll do is just develop your tactical unit based on bases. No pun, no pun meant in there. So if you're uh, an average unit would have, say, four to five bases, but the number of figures you choose to put on a base is entirely down to you because each base simply represents about 75 or 80 men. So if you wanted to, say, go down a 1 to 20 scale, uh, which is what I use, you could have four figures on a base and have five bases as your standard regiment. If your figures are slightly differently based with maybe three on or um, or two on, then it doesn't make any difference. You just the base still represents 80. You just you just use them use them as they are. So actually or, the number of I, figures <coughs> Yeah, I absolutely. Guess you could go completely yeah. mad and do a Sydney Roundwood and put 80 20 Two more figures on the base. Yeah, at, yeah, at, you get, yeah. If you're at the other end and you're, you're really into um, lots, lots of figures, you could go right there. Have eight, ten, uh, or more. It's, it, it's the, it's the same. So uh, you could uh, get away with only uh, a couple of hundred figures uh, to represent your um, divisional action, or you could go up to four, five hundred, or, or more figures. But it, the idea was that the game could cater pretty much for anyone's collection. As long as your collections are similarly based, then you, there'll be no none of that hideous idea about rebasing anything, tearing up your beautifully um, based figures and all the tetrin and, and grass coming off with them. You need to worry about that. It's just put the bases down. Four or five, four bases represents a small unit. Five bases is an average unit. Uh, and a large uh, unit is about seven. That's it. You're done. Cool. We like things that are nice and simple. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just a counter, as a wise man once said. Yeah, that's it. A, a token, wasn't it, Dave? <laughs> a, a token, a counter. A, a token mm. with just a mark with a man on it. Just trying to work out how I can play it with six mil bases. Mm. Yeah. Well you, well, you just need four or five bases per, per unit. Yeah, oh, yeah. Come on, yeah. They keep up. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> or if some <laughs> some people have even come up with a clever idea of if they've got quite large bases, it's just it's calling one of their large bases two or or three or whatever. Yeah, it, it doesn't really matter. It's got it's fairly so flexible it's on that. On measure that it, measuring base widths and be done with it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So in the um, time on a tradition of always wanting more as a war gamer, <laughs> um, you've already just talked about the Napoleonic version. So. Oh. In, indeed, it's what um, it's uh, kind of a sister uh, set of rules uh, for Pickett's Charge, which have at the moment are going by the name of uh, General Darme, and they adopt the similar kind of command uh, mechanisms, etc. But um, obviously, follow quite a, a Napoleonic route, which is mm. slightly more awkward than uh, ACW to design. Um, and I've gone down the line uh, with that set of rules where there's no um, basing requirements at all. There are just simply units are either small, standard, or large. And how you field them is down, is down to the player. Good grief, man. There'll be chaos. <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what. I'm in. I'm in. Where do I sign? <laughs> just, just sign here. I mean, to me, it's, it seems, you know, it seems obvious, isn't it? If you've got, a, if you've got two people with whatever based armies it's an irrelevance isn't it you just as long as you you can identify which ones are small which ones are standard and which ones are large off you go uh, we've had this conversation haven't we now uh, uh, yes i think we have over the, over the years <laughs> <laughs> my army's the same your army's the same where's the problem <laughs> oh i think some people would probably find it there if they wanted to go on about ranges and base depths etc mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to six, well, when it comes to Napoleonics, I've got a thing about sixty by sixty six mil uh, bases, so that might be worth looking at. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, um, before we start jumping into the rules, you know, at quite a low level, one of the things with any of the Lardy's rules is is the command and control mechanisms. Yeah. You see, as, as you're coming in and producing a set of rules for. Um, Provides with, which obviously is a large subsidiary. Yeah. Does yours sort of follow that 
um, idea of being in command and co- command and control to the fore. I was tempted to say, nah, sod it, not doing any of that bloody rubbish. But, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but It sort of uh, seeps in, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it did. But one of the um, the main phase within each turn uh, is com- command and control. I wanted to kind of move the, the game away from kind of unit-based kind of initiatives where people concentrate on moving their, u- their units and winning the game with their just their units through to winning the game through command and control and getting lucky with your units or doing well with your units. So what I de- developed for the con- command and control one was a, a system of we use uh, staff officers uh, effectively, which is a nice or slightly historical name for what is in essence uh, a command pip. But a command pip can give kind of like the wrong impression, I think, um, well, it's often associated with just being able to move your your units or your brigades. Whereas here, staff officers actually carry out tasks. So you will, as the commander, commander in chief, will allocate your staff officers, of which you'll have a varying or limited number, to carry out specific tasks. So you could, for instance, task one of your staff officers to be on a brigade attachment to uh, a brigade, which would give it a command re-roll should its initial command uh, activation roll not succeed. Or you could send more staff officers down to make sure that the brigade gets moving and gets moving quickly um, or move it out of reserve or bring it on a different position in the battlefield or bring it on from the flank. So the staff officer thing was just designed to give players command choices each, each turn. Do you think I've got a limited asset. I've got a limited number of these staff officers. What tasks am I going to give them to? What are they going to do? Where should I concentrate my command effort this turn? And there's no guarantee how many staff officers you get. Sometimes you might get lucky. You might get four, five, six, depending on the size of the game. You could get unlucky. You could only get one or two. Uh, and then you might your command choices are almost made for you. So it was the, the idea of... Um, how shall I say, uh, friction is, is put into that, into that command, uh, process. So that's what, uh, a lot of the time the players are concentrating on. It's using these staff officers to carry out their command effort. Uh, and that's all put together as part of the scenario. Yeah. Well, it's fairly, it's pretty simple. It's the, uh, at the start of the game is that you basically receive one staff officer for every brigade that you field. So if you had, uh, your, typical club night one you might get let's say you get five staff officers and then you roll each turn to see how many are actually available to you and it's just a simple mechanism you just roll a a normal dice for each one of those staff officers if you get a one or a two they're not available to you if you get a three three four five six uh, they're available so out of your five brigades you probably get an average of uh, three um, and your those taskings that uh, I mentioned before can have different costings. So the low level ones might cost you one staff officer. Some really good ones like rallying an entire brigade and regaining casualties and, and re- refreshing its morale will cost you three staff officers. Um, so it, the game will dictate uh, how many of these, uh, these excellent little chaps that you get each turn. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, I, I was slightly distracted because did anybody else, as they was describing that command and control me- mechanic, have they were only playing leapfrog going through this <laughs> the back of their mind, <laughs> or was it just me? No, Neil, it was just you. Okay. What's the phrase? Oh, what a lovely war! No. No, oh, yeah, whatever. No. You're on your uh, own yeah. again, sure. Yeah. What's the phrase? Edit point. Yeah. <laughs> Tumbleweed. Yeah. No, leave it in. <laughs> I was, I was just thinking about you playing this game, Neil, and just like with limited amounts of these officers, you'd be like going, "Oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, but I've only got this." Yeah. <laughs> well, you, w- w- what you mean? I'll be playing the entire game with one stuff officer available. <laughs> if yeah, I'm lucky. Right, but, yeah, but I want to do that as well. Oh, what shall I do? 
That's it. Yes, that's exactly it. And that's normally what I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, we've we've spoken around the usual, you know, how many to put together, how the armies are created. We've got this great little concept of staff officers who can change things, usually for the worst, halfway through a battle. <laughs> Shall we take a little look at the turn sequence and sort of t- talk around how, you know, activation, movement, combat, morale all sort of takes place? It's uh, basically only four phases in each game turn. Uh, the command the command and initiative is the one that we've already touched on. Uh, in addition, once you've posted out all your fantastic staff officers uh, to all their various tasks, they're then put in position with their task teams kind of next to them on a on a marker, which uh, which of course are all rather conveniently provided in the rules. And then each player will just simply roll an activation roll in essence for their brigade. Again, it's dead simple. A one or a two, your brigade uh, isn't active and it's classed as hesitant. It just hesitant simply means that its firing is restricted. You're only firing at effective range. You can't do any kind of speculatory long range fire, and you can't move towards the enemy which kind of prohibits you from uh, advancing. Uh, and if you get a uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, your brigade is obeying orders. It's doing as you want, and off it goes. And it's then at that point that the staff officer taskings will also come into effect. So, for instance, I mentioned the brigade attachment one. So if you roll the 1 or a 2 for your initial brigade activation, the staff officer will give you a re-roll, so you'll get another go. So basically, it's your command effort going in to make sure that that brigade gets going. Uh, and then those brigades are activated and off you go and then that immediately leads uh, on to the second part of the command phase which is the initiative which I think we all know and it's just basically who's going first in the various phases both players just simply roll off it so just a competing 2d6 dice roll uh, and the only modifier is how many hesitant or worse because there is actually a slight worse and um, think brigades uh, you have in your division or your corps so the, the worse your division performs, the less likely you are to gain the initiative, which again harks back to what are you doing with the staff officers? It gives you a different choice. If I want to win the initiative, I need to keep, make sure my staff officers keep my brigades uh, active and going, and maybe I won't be able to invest quite so heavily in any of the, the sexy taskings that, that I want to do. So that's basically a uh, command, and the initiative will tell you, obviously, who, who goes first, and then you move seamlessly into uh, the charge phase and you'll it's each phase it goes uh, charges and then movement and then firing but it's kind of like a, uh, a parallel i go you go so instead of one player just sitting back and watching the opponent uh, charge move and fire the phasing player will charge first uh, and then the, the non-phasing player will do his charges and then you move into uh, movement and again the chap who's got the initiative will will go first uh, followed by the person who's not got the initiative, and finally, uh, firing is uh, con- conducted the same way. Boy, that it's... sounds familiar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> by a strange coincidence, in fact, by now, folks will have heard the episode on Sword Point, and we were, I think, commenting on how well that system seemed to work. When, when it was very much, pretty much that system worked for worked for Sword Point. The only difference, I think, is that you haven't. They have a turn boundary between finishing moving and shooting, and you have it somewhere else. Yeah, that's right. I also find it, isn't it? It keeps everyone involved in the game and um, on their toes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, get all your charges done. Um, the advantage, of course, of moving first is that the uh, opponent can, needs to react to your moves. But then the disadvantage, of course, that you might get caught out by his move. Uh, and likewise, shooting, as long as you, a lot of people, I mean, like gamers are like, they're quite desperate to get in those first volleys, uh, because the casualties cause at the other end don't shoot back. So yeah, it keeps, so, it all keeps the players continuously engaged throughout the turn. Right. So, so I, I take it from the, from that last comment then that shooting in this game is not simultaneous. No, if you've got the initiative, you shoot first. So you'll uh, you'll do all your firing first, followed by the non-phasing player, which again sort of harps back to the command aspect of it. If you want to get the volleys in first, you want to make sure that your staff officers are doing the, the job that you want them to do, and making sure their brigades are obeying orders so that you hopefully will get the initiative. And the one thing the game turn doesn't have, that I consciously uh, eliminated, was a morale phase or a rally phase. If there are any 
morale checks are just indicated. Uh, so if you have a particularly devastating volley, there'll be a morale requirement there and then. And that's just a very simple uh, morale check. Roll 2d6, and if you score a certain number, then then you pass. There's very few modifiers. And all the rallies, so all if you have broken units or routed units and those those traditional states, you don't rally. There's no morale phase to do it. It's all done in the command phase, which, again, is another job for your staff officers. And to get brigades obeying orders, if they obey orders, then your broken units will rally. If your brigade is hesitant and doesn't obey orders, then the broken units don't rally. So not only is it it did two things. It kind of sped the game up. So there's no endless going through loads of modifiers, seeing if you've rallied and, you know, if you've got supports. It was, it's all dependent on how well your brigade is functioning. So if you function well, you rally. If you're not functioning well, uh, the men aren't doing very well and they're feeling a little bit upset at the back. And that is the game turn. Again, nice and simple and, uh, very neat. How does, um, sort of shooting work? Is it a I'm guessing there will, there will be a dice um, <laughs> of some sort. Yeah, shooting's one of the, the uh, few consistents I kind of kept for the likes of um, General to Brigade and Guns at Gettysburg. I wanted to keep a 2d6 basic roll. You you can have your regiment, which is uh, lined up, ready to volley. And again, the the chart does it all for you. So you either you're firing on a small regiment line, the standard regiment line, or a, you know, a large regiment line. There's a few modifiers that you would use your ones you would expect, a bit for cover, a bit for your formation. Uh, you simply roll 2d6, and somewhere within that bell curve, uh, you'll get a result. Usual, it's the usual stuff, isn't it? Very low results could result in your fine regiment losing its fire discipline, which, which uh, in the rules we just uh, represent by putting a little bit of cotton wool or a uh, puff of smoke on it to represent it's lost its fire discipline and won't be firing quite as well the next turn through through to an average volley on, or if you get get lucky or you've got some very good regiments or armed with all the latest tech from the uh, the ACW like repeaters etc then you could end up at the top end of the scale and the top end of the scale will inflict a certain number of casualties uh, and uh, one of those immediate morale tests, or uh, or as they're rather interesting called, see the elephant tests in the rules. <laughs> see the elephant. <laughs> oh, I wonder what that might refer to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, as I say, cause I, 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 one thing that I was about to ask is that obviously, we, yeah, we've already hinted through a couple of things you said before. Is that actually, as a, a period, the ACW is quite interesting. Be- Simply because of the the sheer breadth of of technology that that was used yeah. in those few years, basically, how have you kind of catered for that in in, in both infantry weapons and artillery? artillery. Yeah, um, well, with great difficulty it does come to mind because it was, I think, very easy to uh, drown, perhaps in the in number of weapons and the types of weapons etc mm. that are in especially in the acw period so again I, one of the core tenets of of my rule writing is it is has been simplicity so i thought well we need to you need to represent these uh, weapons but you need to keep it fairly simple so uh, i just went down the line of if you have let's say for for instance a a, a flintlock musket that's simply classed as an inferior weapon and an inferior weapon will always fire on the uh, the lowest uh, volley line. So you just always refer to that. If you've got uh, something like breech loaders or repeaters uh, uh, at a at a reasonable range or effective range, then you'll get some extra dice, which uh, which are termed as casualty dice, which are added to your two d six roll, and they just inflict extra casualties. And likewise with the uh, the artillery, uh, I've just kept it fairly. Simple. You've got you know, just kept it as six pounders. Uh, when the, that was the, in the early period with the six pounders. You've got rifle batteries. And you've got twelve pounder smooth balls, which was your your great kind of canister killers of the time. Uh, and then you've got mixed batteries, and they all just fire uh, as a battery under one of those headings. And it's they're just guided by. Uh, they're, they're kind of rough performances. So obviously six pounders haven't got a, a great deal of range. Uh, whereas 12 pounders have got a reasonable range and quite hefty canister, uh, attack. Whereas rifles have got 
are much more accurate. They've got a longer range, but then their canister is not quite as good as 12 pounder. So I've kind of just kept it deliberately fairly tight and, and reduced it rather than going down into kind of boring down into the, the, the myriad of different kind of weapons that exist. So it's all just based in on a kind of general uh, category, be it rifles or, or um, smooth balls. I do like the, the idea of your shooting having a possible negative effect on, on yourself. Um, when you said when, when you get to the, the bottom of the bell curve and it can affect your, your, your firing. I'm, I'm trying to think of another set of rules that does that, and I can't think of one. And we've got two, we've got um, two, because I thought it's one of those uh, things, isn't it, that how do we discourage our good old, you know, our players from firing at everything, every turn, every go? Regardless, and you can you can go down the ammo line. I suppose, can't you? I mean, various sets will tick off bits of ammo. Well, I thought, right. Well, one of the discouraging things, if you're firing at ludicrous targets like I don't know skirmishers at long range, hiding in some kind of works or something, then the odds are that your men could fall into disorder or lose their fire discipline. So you're you're. It's just it's to kind of encourage a little bit of history to say that well they. They held their fire for a good reason, because what you don't want to do is lose your fire discipline, and then the enemy come charging at you, and you've, uh, you've, you'll go to pieces. And the same uh, similar mechanism applies to artillery. But artillery don't lose their fire discipline. Uh, what they do is they actually take uh, what's called a fatigue casualty. So if you keep firing your artillery at kind of long-range, very difficult targets, there's a good chance you'll end, at the bo- end up at the bottom of that bell curve, and that will give you a, a fatigue casualty, uh, which simply represents that you're wearing out your gunners and wearing out your batteries. And there'll come a point when you might you'll need to withdraw those batteries um, because they've they've taken um, so many casualties and fatigue casualties. It's kind of telling players or inviting players, I should say, not to fire your guns uh, all the time at, at, at ridiculous targets. It's to if you want to keep a battery on the field, then concentrate it. Its effort upon uh, realistic targets, or otherwise you'll uh, you'll wear yourself out. Mm. And, uh, what, just that moves on to one of the one of the other taskings uh, that you can do with your staff officers is to order artillery assault fire, which increases your fire rate of your guns. I you know prior to an assault or something. But the downside of that artillery assault fire is that if you get a a, a low roll your artillery fatigue casualties are, are doubled. So you wear your gunners out a lot more quickly if you're if you're unlucky uh, and you get a bad roll or you're firing at very difficult targets. Again, that's interesting. I, I have to admit, I I'm, don't know very much about the ATW, but you, you did mention skirmishers. So how do skirmishers actually act in the rules? Are they something that will be attached to a battalion and just give a sort of modifier to the, to the, to the battalion? Or uh, do they work completely independently? Yeah, I got, I've got the three. Um, I thought, yeah, look, again, let's go for a, try to keep it vaguely simple and keep it easy for players to sort of control skirmishes. Because what you did, I, I didn't really want to go down was uh, an issue where kind of every regiment that could peel off its two companies and then you've got to control them and, and look after them as kind of different units. So we just simply went down the line of you can have the very top end of the scale, I suppose, that each uh, division is allowed to field one sniper who's, um, you know, your, your super crack shot, fancy rifle with uh, telescopic sights who's uh, who can be fielded on his own and he's got some uh, uh, very you know, bes- bespoke rules that go with him. Uh, and the two main skirmish formations are simply sharpshooter units. Um, so you've got your classic sharpshooter units of, of the period you, they, they're just fielded as permanent skirmishes and they're attached to a brigade. So if you had a brigade of, say, four regiments, you would just attach them to that brigade. And then each regiment, as they did uh, in the period, each regiment is capable of deploying into skirmish order itself. So you just move your, your bases, your four bases, your five bases or whatever, you just spread them out and, and a, a set distance just to represent that. Uh, and then off you go. And skirmishing brings with it some advantages like clearly you're somewhat harder to hit but it also brings uh, with it its disadvantages your firepower is um, is is markedly reduced and you're far less likely to stand if the enemy charge you 
So you'll probably find yourself running away. And we also introduced a, a rule where to kind of stop players putting everything into skirmish, which we've, uh, I've, when I've played ACW games before, you said often you would find the entire world appears to be in skirmish order. We decided well, if you want to reform your, your regiments back into, into close order formation, then they need to fall back behind another formed up regiment in order to do so. So you couldn't do anything like roaring forward in skirmish and then quickly forming up at a hedge and then going on. You'd have to have a close order support uh, up there to uh, to get you to do that. So so basically, it, it's, it's three types of skirmishes. Uh, snipers, uh, sharpshooters, and your regiments thrown out into uh, a skirmish line. Okay, then. Uh, similar sort of question, I suppose, but relating to cavalry. Because obviously one of the... The issues again with the period is is the changing role of cavalry, and uh, so, so how do you deal with that? Especially with again, I suppose yeah, that that changing role where it started to become mounted infantry. I think the advice uh, in that is um, is get off the horse, um, or else it's, you're <laughs> you're going to uh, you're going to end up uh, in in trouble. The same similar concept, isn't it? You're, you're, you can build a, a regiment. And it'll have a certain armament. It can, you can fill your regiment with uh, muskets or with carbines, or if you're really lucky, breech loaders or repeaters. If you want to, you can conduct your, your full blo- bloody cavalry charges. Hopefully, you'll be doing that against enemy cavalry who are, with have no infantry or artillery anywhere near them. And then you'll probably get in and you might have the classic kind of almost Napoleonic clash of sabers. Or if you're more sensible, you'll probably just dismount them. Dismounting is fairly simple. You just simply lose a base from your cavalry unit that goes and sits at the rear or wherever you want to put it, and the cavalry deploy. Again, they can deploy in line or they can deploy into skirmish, uh, and they'll operate exactly the same as as a line regiment. They're just a little bit. There's just one modifier or tweak in the rules just to represent they're not quite as uh, durable or as um, I should say as tough as as uh, proper line regiments. But that's generally what you'll see. You'll see two tactics then. Um, in the rules, you'll either see players thundering their cavalry forward as if they're kind of uh, French Napoleonic cuirassiers, and then after a few artillery shots, you'll see them thundering all back again with considerably uh, less figures, or you'll see them do the perhaps the slightly more um, historical tactic, which is ride up, get get into some cover, get off those horses, and basically use yourself as as dismounted infantry. Thought of everything he has now for you, you know, you can. Do your proper cavalry charge now, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Dave. <laughs> I like it. I like it when war games writers always think about Neil Shook and knowing what tactic he'll want to use. Is it probably... really? Is it really fair to dignify it with the word tactic? <laughs> Neil Neil tells me it's a valid tactic, the charge tactic. Yeah, well, it sounds very much like my tactics. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's why I gave him the knights on last Sunday. <laughs> yeah, look what I did with them. <laughs> charge! Line them up knights. and charge, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Seems, seems perfectly reasonable to me. Uh, <clears throat> talking of charging, we've been getting this slightly back to front, I suppose, because we got into the, uh, we, we got very much into, into the nitty, nitty gritty of shooting uh, and, and how that was represented without kind of really talking that much about movement. Assuming that part of your answer will be trying to keep things simple. Yep. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Uh, I mean, most of us do have a bit of a pet hate about micromanagement movement. So, how is movement actually handled considering you know we have potentially quite large units what's the movement can they ha- how does the movement can they actually work the overarching kind of control for your uh, individual regiments uh, is the brigade and the brigadier each brigade is commanded by a brigadier general who is represented by uh, hopefully your finely painted figure on a nice base and i've i've had to introduce a command radius. I know some people might not, might not go to, uh, particularly like that sort of thing, but there's a command radius there that keeps the brigade within a certain radius of that brigadier, uh, and that keeps the brigade uh, together. If you drop out of that command radius, you're then limited to a, a, a very few actions that you could t- you can take. So ultimately, if you want to get that unit back, the brigadier's got to go back and go back and get him. The units can take their individual movement. 
in the movement phase. There are basically two types of movement. One is your, your basic movement, which is your pretty much your standard six inch type move. Uh, and the other one is using the double quick mode. So if you've, again, if you've pushed your staff officers down to your brigade and uh, ordered them to double quick, you get a standard move and you get a certain uh, amount of random additional move added on by the dice roll. So you would roll four, for 50 mil, you'd roll four extra D6 and add all that score together. So you could roll, I don't know, say four fours, you get 16, that gets added to your, your basic move uh, and off you go. And that just represents brigades uh, and the individual units getting a, getting a bit of a, a shifty on and getting moving. And it also helps the fact that the opponent or the various players can never be absolutely sure of A, how far your brigades or your units will move, and B, is how far they will charge, because you can also use double quick to order units to charge and get an increased charge bonus. But again, that's it's it's randomised, so no one will know exactly what it will be. And then to move up the next next step is that each brigade must uh, keep its position uh, in the battle line. So unless the CNC uh, orders it to do something else, it's got to stay in the line of of the rest of the brigades. So you can't suddenly decide, right, well, I'm going to take this brigade um, that's now deployed on the right flank and, and scuttle it all the way over to the left uh, unless you give it an order, again, via staff officers from the CNC. So they, they hold their position in the battle line. The brigadier holds his units together within a, a certain uh, raid command radius, uh, and then the units can manoeuvre forward, taking their kind of standard uh, move, or, or double quick if they're dead lucky. That is basically movement for you. Well, I suppose, having gone through all our turn sequence, uh, I, I suppose the logical next question is, well, actually, how do you win the game? Well, uh, very simply, I suppose, it's by defeating the enemy. You Basically, you'll find that as you... Uh, Break opposing units, which are, use a very ACW term called whipped. So if you have uh, two whipped units in your brigade, your brigade will immediately convert to a, a faltering brigade. Or if you even get a single route, uh, your brigade will immediately convert to a faltering brigade. And faltering brigades are what you want uh, to avoid because they bring uh, a number of issues. When it comes, flips around to the next command phase, you'll roll for your staff officers as normal and you'll have your handful, half dozen or so of staff officers. But each faltering brigade will demand a, a payment of, in effect, one staff officer to uphold your divisional morale. Uh, if you don't or can't uh, pay that cost, then the brigade will break and to use the, the the phrase that's in the rules, they are, they will be catawantuously chewed up uh, and will uh, break and retire a goodly distance to the rear with their various broken units uh, disintegrating. And also, just to make life slightly more difficult for the, the unfortunate player, you'll permanently lose the staff officer that's attached to that brigade. So as you have broken and routed units, there's a chance that your faltering brigades will then break and when they break, you'll lose staff officers. Uh, and then gradually, your entire commander control system will, will be eroded. So you could end up with just two staff officers. Therefore, it becomes extremely difficult. And then the conclusion of the game, either it be a uh, scenario, objective, or just simply uh, playing to defeat the enemy, or playing to break a certain number of brigades uh, that you could set up in the uh, beforehand. So you could say, right, we'll play until two, three or four brigades are broken and you'll play to that. But once you start losing uh, units and once you start having faltering brigades, it seriously uh, impacts on your game. You can get it back if you get lucky. If you get a reasonable amount of staff officers, you can recover your faltering brigades and they'll, they'll, they'll carry on. Uh, but if you don't, things will go bad. Uh, go quite badly for you uh, and if you roll quite poorly like I do on your command roll then they'll go very badly indeed so it's basically using your units to inflict defeats and routes upon the enemy and then hope that the uh, subsequently 
broken or faltering brigades uh, will break up as you go through the various game turns. Is there a base removal in this game? How dare you mention that? Uh, no, there isn't. Ooh. Good. <laughs> Good. Good man. <laughs> Yeah, there's no base like... removal. Uh, there is uh, what I call the uh, attritional casualty uh, system, where you do uh, mark off the casualties as they you that you lose them, or in fact sometimes you can you can even get them back. And it's just a, a straightforward thing. Each the casualty is just the uh, kind of war games term, isn't it, to represent you know morale, fatigue, shock, whatever you like. And small units will have. Um, a set number of casual, uh, casualty level, which is probably about, uh, normally about 10. Your standard units will be 12, and your larger units will be 14. And as you go through your the casualties, there are four levels. So you can be fresh, up to three. You can take uh, one, two, three casualties. You're still classed as fresh. But once you get to four, you're on basically a little bit worn, so you'll get a minus one. And that minus one will be a consistent. So it's a minus one on your morale, it's a minus one on your firing, and it's a minus one on melee and other things. When you get to eight, we'll be on a minus two. Uh, again, it carries all the way through all the modifiers and tests. So uh, as your unit becomes attrited and is worn out, it becomes its ability to perform becomes less and less, uh, and its ability to run away becomes more and more. So it's much easier for the thing to break. And eventually, when you get to your... Um, your, your limit, be it 10 casualties or 12 casualties, you're basically used up and you're dispersed and the entire unit is taken off as one. So there's no individual base removal uh, at all. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in that case then, what do you normally recommend for tracking those uh, casualty as you accrue them? There are two methods. In the rules, we provide a really quite spiffing roster sheet, if you want to use that, just to so you just make a note of the unit and just mark them off as you go along. Or uh, I, I use, them, and what I think a lot of other people use in uh, different rule sets, is, is a casualty marker that is just uh, with the unit. So that, that can, uh, I think a lot of manufacturers these days, you can have little dice holders with your little mini dice that can just be at the back of the unit. And you just flip it over as, as you get to the, the various casualty yeah. levels. Or you can even have a little casualty on those. I think you can get some quite nice, as somebody um, rather unpleasantly called them, dialer stiff. Um, you've got... <laughs> <laughs> I've not heard that it's one. It's got those, uh, they're those um, dial, kind of casualty dials, aren't they, from the various yes. manufacturers. And some people put a little casualty you know a painted casualty on it and and, and tart up the base so it looks quite nice so it kind of fits in with all the scenery uh, and as as the, as the casualties accrue you you move your dial around to reflect reflect the current number so it's it, one of those two methods whichever uh, well, multiple methods whichever people want to feel most comfortable with okay now i'm really interested about the um napoleonic rules which we'll come back to in a bit <laughs> Because I'm, I'm not really into ATW, but I'm into Napoleonics, and I've got an awful lot of 15 mil Napoleonics. Oh, oh very good, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I'm just looking for a set of rules to play with them, and I've tried all sorts. <laughs> so, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. So, scenarios, then. What sort of scenarios have you got planned, then? A number of books, fan of scenarios, some of which are already underway. We're having one scenario book, probably based in the, uh, the early period of the war down in the Peninsula campaign, is the the Union push towards Richmond. That's uh, ideally suited to uh, basically a, a series of linked scenarios, almost kind of forming a, a mini campaign because it was all very uh, restricted. And you can kind of fight one engagement, uh, followed by another, followed by another with the same forces all slightly reinforced. So there's uh, that one planned. And then there's the, uh, of course, uh, can we know uh, ACW, rules without the accompanying uh, various scenarios from uh, Gettysburg. So you'll have the scenarios from the, the three days from that battle all, all presented uh, for you. Um, and then there might follow up uh, one on uh, and, and Tetum and and the other campaigns. But that's what we, uh, we're going for at the moment. Is be, it'll be uh, the main two, probably be the Peninsula one and 
and Gettysburg. And are there any actually contained in the main rulebook? Uh, there is uh, an introductory uh, scenario for you to work through, which is one I mentioned slightly earlier, which is the uh, attack on the bloody lane uh, at An- Antietam to uh, enable players just to work through and get the uh, get the basic mechanics. Um, but as, as far as the, the scenario books are concerned, I'm still scribbling away on those. Mm. Um, are you going to be producing those in PDFs or hardback or...? It'll be, it'll be, yeah, it'll be um, probably hard copy uh, and PDF. That will probably be down to uh, uh, Richard himself to make that final decision. But uh, I suspect it might be a combination, combination of both. On those. Talking of Richard, that's what we call one of our fine segues. <laughs> so this is the first set of rules to come out from Ricebits Press. How do you start the sort of communication with Richard about producing these rules? It uh, initially started when Richard came down to uh, our club in Essex. He ventured uh, into deepest, darkest Essex to present us with a uh, play test or you know, play run through of one of his uh, his new games, uh, Chain of Command, I think that. it was. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's, uh, he introduced us to that. Had a, a, a great time. Obviously, yeah, uh, there was an opportunity to... Uh, talk to Richard uh, about rules, about writing rules, about developing and design, and and we found that kind of Richard and I came in from uh, a, a fairly similar similar place with regard to, you know, history and it, its place in wargaming, uh, etc. And it developed from there, and it was, uh, you know, it's a, it was simply for me, isn't it? It's an opportunity to work with, what, you know, a, a very well-established and, and kind of forward-thinking uh, designer in the hobby, and that was an opportunity not to be missed. So, uh, you know, after that conversation, we certainly followed up from there, and uh, Ricefish Press was born. Oh, he, de- he needs not to listen to this, that's going to go through his head. <laughs> you can edit that later. <laughs> <laughs> We're only teasing you, Rich. <laughs> I can give another version if you like, if you just insert which one you like. <laughs> yes, not please. quite so complimentary. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, considering that, um, as far as uh, Wargames periods is concerned, uh, you know, AC, uh, ACW is uh, a period that has a fair smattering mm. of rules uh, around, shall we say. Uh, what would you say is different about Pickett's Charge, or, and I suppose in, in, in the current vernacular, uh, what, is its, what is its unique selling point? Oh, the USP. <laughs> What I've tried to do uh, with this uh, set of rules is, is to go is to introduce three things. You need there's some hopefully uh, historical war games uh, realism there. Obviously they're not you know they're, they're not real, but they 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 produce a kind of a, a war game that looks and feels and kind of captures the period um, uh, flavor of the uh, the ACW uh, combined with I think. Uh, simplicity and to coin a phrase or coin a word friction when uh, I was writing uh, General Brigade and Guns at Gettysburg they were I think written for uh, a different time in wargaming and I think you need to reinvigorate yourself reinvigorate rules uh, and approach them uh, from a new way taking into account all the, the new developments uh, that have that come through the hobby and which, which have been many over the say the last I can't remember how long Guns of Bay, Gettysburg has been out probably about 10 years, but there's been a lot of development in that time and a lot of new thinking. And the idea hmm. was to was to reinvigorate my thinking of the period and how was it done, how was it fought, uh, but to capture that that new thinking. I mean, people play uh, war games, I think, slightly differently now. There's a different aspect uh, to it. They're not as... They don't have uh, perhaps as much time, and they certainly don't want to, I, I think, spend as much time running through multiple tables of factors, adding them all up and, and, and then subtracting them all, getting to um, a conclusion at the end, and then somebody else pipes up and says, oh, hang on a minute, did you include column? And so then we all have to stop and, and start again. It was just concentrating on, on rules that are uh, simple, re- reflect the period, but are, are intuitive enough that players can get them straight away. And 
combine all that with the uh, command and control thing, which uh, uh, I may have mentioned uh, once, is about the, how your the staff officers are used to give specific taskings and instructions to brigades. This gives you a significant number of uh, command choices each turn. You've got to make some decisions with your limited resource. And at times, the, the game will be making those decisions for you if it's going badly. But that's, I think, is, is where it's, uh, it's different. It takes on board all the new uh, thinking and new thoughts about ACW and about wargaming uh, combined uh, with this command and control system where I'm trying to give players command decisions each turn, something concrete to think about, uh, as opposed to just simply moving units forward um, in, in, a, in a fairly normal manner. So uh, so hopefully, if they all come together, um, hopefully they work. Cool, good stuff. Right, so we've talked about uh, the rules. We've talked, uh, we talked a bit about scenario books uh, and, and what you're hoping to do with those. But obviously, well, we've just done it two or three times now, looking at future, potential future developments, and you're already thinking about Napoleonics. Um, yeah, I probably made the, the mm. slight error of trying to develop two rules simultaneously. So in the end, I thought, right, I'm going to put the Napoleons to one side and finish the ACW. But in, in, invariably, there, were lots, there was lots of kind of cross fertilization between the two rules. Yeah. Uh, I've kept the staff officer command and control system, moved uh, that over into the Napoleonics, though I've rather subtly uh, changed the name from staff officer to ADC. You see? <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I was just about to ask that exact question. <laughs> so that's that, that kind of uh, that, uh, that that did the job on that one. But obviously, there's different taskings um, available in Napoleonics, uh, and I've worked into uh, the Napoleonic set uh, the same philosophy, which again is to make it look Napoleonic. Does it feel Napoleonic? And 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 for me, at a, at a tactical level game where you're playing with brigades, divisions, etc. That is generally, um, you need to have lines, columns and squares and skirmishes or skirmish lines represented in one form or another. So, so that they're, all, they're all there. Trying to simplify and to uh, make a, a reasonable go of all the interplay between cavalry and infantry and squares and the different artillery was challenging but I I think we're there on, on on that one. We've pushed pushed forward to some other aspects. I think we mentioned on the fact, isn't it, that in the Napoleonic version, uh, again, there's no base removal. There's no worrying about how many uh, bases of any unit. You just simply say it's a, it's a small unit, it's a standard unit, or it's a large unit. And I've developed uh, uh, those rules more or less in tandem. And they've now got to the stage where we've got about quite a large battle coming up at the War Games Holiday Centre with them pretty much in their, their final version. Uh, and then we'll be uh, ready to go. And um, the and new Napoleon at one uh, will hit the field uh, again, looking you know, at uh, new ideas. I think your ideas on Napoleonic combat changes. So it's um, it's very different from the way General Brigade worked. It's it's certainly not in the same milk as that, um, and that's and that's how it's developed. So uh, so we're there. So I should think uh, maybe in the next few months or early 2017 we might well see the release of uh, General Darme as it's uh, called at the moment. You can put me down for a set, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can I peel order now? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> It'll give you uh, an opportunity to get all your <laughs> Napoleonic lead pile painted up uh, and ready to go. Oh, they're pretty much painted. Oh, thank <laughs> Excellent. So these can be purchased by the, the um, current Pickers Charge. Can be purchased from that their Lardy site, I believe. Two Fat Lardies, yeah, on their uh, website. They're up, uh, ready to go. And they, um, I think they're going for a very, very reasonable um, 24 English pounds. So yeah, you can uh, you can obtain those uh, now. Should you wish, you can all go now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, and so are, are they available as uh, what what uh, hard copy PDF? 
uh, both. So uh, both. it was a, a hard copy uh, and a PDF. I think um, that's very much, I think, uh, Richard's uh, way of thinking, way of business is that um, PDFs and hard copy kind of go hand in hand. So, uh, yeah, uh, you can get them in either format. And Cool. Uh, and one, one question which we haven't asked. How, how big is it? How many pages is it? Oh, now you ask. Um, <laughs> it's probably about, he says, flicking through the open copy he's got in front of him, flipping to the end. <laughs> seamlessly. <laughs> seamlessly, seamlessly. It's uh, 82 pages, I believe. Uh, uh, eight, you're dead on. It's 82 pages, yeah. 82 like pages in glorious Technicolor. With two A4 laminated play sheets as well. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I always go for, um, I think play sheets are important. I tend to develop my rules from a four-sided play sheet. I find if I can get a set of rules done on a four-sided play sheet that, that vaguely works, and then, then I'm kind of close to home, and then I just kind of build the rules up from the play sheet. So uh, you'll always get a, uh, a four-sided play sheet uh, in the rule set. Well, Dave, um, yeah, I th- well, I think that sounds like, what's the phrase, uh, sold? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, yeah, sir. sold. <laughs> yeah, but the first thing I bought off the new Lardy site, which means I won't have to remember my password. Oh, marvellous, marvellous. Yeah, give it a run. Yeah, it's quite interesting doing that. I've not done that sort of thing before, so it's uh, uh, something new. Something new. it's quite interesting. I mean, really. Stupid. I mean, stupid. Question. I mean, I mean, I mean, how have you? I mean, how have you found that pro? How, Found that process where you know you're not the person develop. You know, although you're de- the person developing the rules, it's very, been very much a case of you know you lay out. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, because obviously, I mean, the layout for these was done by um, Henry Hyde, wasn't it? Yeah, Henry. Yeah, no. To be honest, it was. Um, they were both uh, ex- extremely uh, both useful and and helpful in the process. Rich was great. Just what you both said. You know, this is. Uh, vaguely you know what we want and how we want to produce it he was very um, happy to let me just uh, kind of write the set of rules that uh, i was writing obviously he came over a couple of times isn't it to to um to play the game he obviously on the first time round, was probably wanted to make sure they weren't a complete pile of crap um and i think i managed to persuade him that they weren't so we've had a good couple of games uh, and then henry um when he was doing all the formatting i think was Extremely helpful. Sending me some very, uh, some informative, great emails about, you know, um, his wealth of experience in writing, about how to do things, how to improve stuff. So no, it was, um, they were, uh, both of them were a, a fantastic help. So they're really good, really good to work with. Brilliant, great stuff. Well, Dave, it's been a pleasure to chat. Thank you so much for coming on. Indeed. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it sounds like we need to make another date for, for early 2017 for when n- n- the Napoleonic Wars come Yeah. I shall, uh, I shall look forward to it. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll save some gaming fun to buy them. <laughs> As will Hopsy, I think. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. All right. Fantastic stuff. Well, as I say, Dave, thank you so much. Uh, we wish you all the very best with Pickett's Charge. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you soon. Cheers, Neil. Thank you very much, mate. Bye. One star officer jumped right over another star officer's back. And another staff officer jumped right over that other staff officer's back. A third staff officer jumped right over two other staff officers' backs. And a fourth staff officer jumped right over all the other staff officers' backs. One staff officer jumped right over another staff officer's back. And another staff officer jumped right over that other staff officer's back. A third staff officer jumped right over two other staff officers' backs. And a fourth staff officer jumped right over all the other staff officers' backs. They were only playing me from They were only playing me from They were only playing me from When one staff officer jumped right over another staff officer's back They were only playing me from They were only playing me from They were only playing me from When one staff officer jumped right over another staff officer's back So there you have it. Everything you wanted to know about Pickett's Charge from the mouth of the author himself. I hope that's giving you a good overview of the rules, the way they work, and some of the design ideas behind them. 
as you said, they're currently available from the Two Fat Lardies website, and they will cost you the princely sum of £24 as a hard copy or £15 in PDF. I think that sounds really interesting. I mean, ACW is not my period. Of all kind of the mainstream periods, ACW really isn't the one that massively appeals to me. I kind of thought I should have something ACW. So when the 150th anniversary edition of of Battle Cry uh, was available, I bought that. And I mean, that's, that, to be honest, yeah, that is a really nice game in itself. Uh, yeah, lovely artwork and what have you. And obviously, it's memoir. It's kind of, yeah, it's Command and Colors uh, sort of system. Uh, so I kind of went with that as my kind of ACW fix, if you like. This sounds like an interesting system. Obviously, fast play, which is something uh, you know I quite like. So it's certainly tempting. And whether you play this with, uh, I don't know, uh, you get the the Perry's 28 mil box set, uh, which is obviously an option for whether you're playing this or whether you're playing sharp practice. Uh, I don't think I'd ever convince Dave to do 28 mil, but there you go. Uh, or actually look at the fabulous ACW stuff that Pete Derry does in 6 mil. It is somewhat tempting. I think I'll have to have a conversation with Dave and we'll, and we'll kind of see if this fits in with uh, what we're planning to do for the next year. So there you have it, Pickett's Charge. Just before we go, I just want to say, mention one little thing. Obviously on this show, uh, you heard my cops. Now, Mike's taking a break for a few weeks. Uh, he's recently started a new job, and he just wants to, uh, you know, uh, basically there's too much going on to include everything uh, in his current schedule. So he's taking a break from the podcast for a few weeks. But don't worry. He'll be coming, he'll be back on the show in the new year. So Mike's taking a break, so you won't hear him on the next few shows. Wishing well as he as he settles into his new job. In the next two or three shows, we'll be coming up with. We'll have another interview. We'll be chatting with Richard Clark uh, on about Voice Fits Press and Two Fat Lardies. So we'll be catching up with the other side of Voice Fits Press uh, as far as the publishing side is concerned. And of course, we'll also be chatting about what we've been up to hobby-wise and chatting about hobby news. So that'll be coming up in the next couple of shows. And we've got several other things lined up for you uh, in the near future. And as I said at the start of the show, because we're going to be releasing these uh, as shorter shows, the the other thing is is that that means that uh, I'll be releasing them more often because I'll be releasing the shows as I finish editing segments as opposed to waiting to put you know a dozen half a dozen segments together and editing and then into that and putting them together as one show so you'll be getting a show probably at least once a week maybe at times even and more often than that let me know what you think uh, always interested in your feedback let me know if this works for you okay all that's left to be said is thank you once again for listening. We really appreciate it. Happy gaming. Take care of yourselves and we'll speak to you very, very soon. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, why not share it with others by leaving us a review on iTunes? And if you have any comments or questions, you can always email the show. The address is info at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk And you can also visit our webpage, where you'll find a complete episode archive, all the View from the Veranda podcasts, rules reviews, and our blog of hobby items and news, which is updated several times a week. This is also where you'll find the links to our presence on social media. And here you can follow us on Twitter or join our Facebook group. And finally, here you can also find details should you wish to support us by making a donation to the podcast. All this on the Meeples and Miniatures website, www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. 
The Meeple Some Nature's podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 unported license. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank <laughs> you.